Today's episode is brought to you by the Daily Gardener Friday Newsletter. You can sign up for the newsletter over at thedailygardener.org. Hi there, and welcome to The Daily Gardener, a podcast about garden history and botanical literature. I'm your host, Jennifer Ebling, and today is March 31st. Today in garden history, we celebrate the birth of Andrew Marvel, the English poet and politician. He was born on this day, March 31st in 1621. Andrew was a friend of John Milton, and in addition to writing The Garden, one of the most famous English poems of the 17th century, he wrote this little garden verse. I have a garden of my own, but so with roses overgrown and lilies, that you would, it guess, to be a little wilderness." And today is the birthday of Dietrich Brandis, the German forester and botanist. He was born on this day, March 31st in 1824. Dietrich is remembered as the father of forestry in India, the father of modern forest management, and the father of tropical forestry. Concerned about the unregulated destruction of the forests in India, the British, back in the 1800s, wanted people in India to help manage and protect the trees. And so in 1856, Dietrich left his botany professorship in Bonn, where his father had been a professor, and he pursued a civil service position managing the teak forests in Burma. Eight years later, Dietrich was put in charge of all the forests in India. He had done such a good job. In Carl Alwyn Schenck's Birth of Forestry in America, that wonderful book, there is a fascinating story about how Dietrich inventoried the teak trees in the forest. And this is an incredible account. It reads like this. Dietrich rode an elephant on such trails as there were, with four sticks in his left hand and a pocket knife in his right. And whenever he saw in the bamboo thickets a teak tree within 200 feet of his trail, he cut a little notch in the stick, number one, two, three, or four, denoting the diameter of the tree. Isn't that ingenious? And then it continues, and at the end of the day, after traveling some 20 miles, Dietrich had collected forest stand data for a sample plot 400 feet wide and 20 miles long, containing some 1,900 acres. And then it continues, Dietrich continued his cruise for a number of months, sick with malaria in a hellish climate. But that's not all. Check out this next little bit. They're going to talk about a trepanning surgery. He had brain surgery where they had to drill into his skull. So here's what it says. Moreover, he underwent a trepanning operation or brain surgery. And for the rest of his life, he carried a small hole in his head filled with white cotton in the front of his skull. But he emerged from his cruise through the forest with the knowledge that he needed for his great enterprise. And so you can see how his title as the father of forestry in India is so well deserved. Dietrich established principles of modern sustainable agroforestry that are still followed today. And for two decades, he measured, itemized, and chronicled the forests of India. Dietrich also started forest management schools, and he himself created the training protocols for his own employees. In 1878, Dietrich founded the Forest Research Institute in the Dune Valley in Dehradun. 
This building is gorgeous. You can see pictures of it on Twitter. People stop by and visit it. It is so lovely. It's styled in Greco-Roman architecture, and it is the largest purely brick structure in the world, and it was Dietrich's Forest Research Institute. Now, Sir Joseph Hooker recognized Dietrich's work, and he named the flowering plant genus Brandesia in his honor. And today we wish a happy heavenly birthday to William Waldorf Astor, the American-British attorney, politician, businessman of hotels and newspapers, and philanthropist. He was born on this day, March 31st in 1848. Now, I had a blast researching William Waldorf Astor. Early newspaper accounts about him are so fascinating. In 1891, they reported that a tall, shy William Waldorf Astor moved to Britain after declaring that, quote, America is not a fit place for a gentleman to live. And so he moved to England. Well, after a decade of living there, William bought a rundown, double moated castle named Hever Castle, and it happened to be Anne Boleyn's family home. She had lived there over 400 years earlier. Well, between 1904 and 1908, William oversaw the installation of extensive gardens on the property around Hever Castle. And these gardens were designed by Frank Pearson. Now, to make his vision a reality, William had to divert water from a nearby river in order to make a 35-acre lake. And it is said that 800 men hand-dug and then stomped on the clay soil to make the bottom of the lake. Mature trees were then harvested from Ashdown Forest, and then they were transplanted at Hever. That was no small task in the early 1900s. And then William had two mazes installed. So if you love labyrinths, this would be a great place to go. There are topiary chessmen that were pruned for the chess garden. And then thousands of roses were brought in for the rose garden. But that's not all. In fact, the most impressive garden at Hever was and is the Italian garden, which features colonnades, classical sculptures that are drop-dead gorgeous, antiquities dating back to Roman times, and a loggia. There's also a long pergola at one end that features cool, dripping fountains the entire length. That's what I want to see. Well, even today, it is staggering to think that the entire project at Hever Castle was completed in four short years. Incredible. All right, and today is also the birthday of the American author, motivational speaker, and professor in the Department of Special Education at the University of Southern California. And of course, I'm talking about Leo Biscaglia, who was born on this day, March 31st in 1924. Leo believed that education should be the process of helping everyone to discover his or her uniqueness. Now, Leo was also a gardener, and he learned to garden from his father. He once wrote, To this day, I cannot see a bright daffodil, a proud gladiola, or a smooth eggplant without thinking of Papa. Like his plants and trees, I grew up as part of his garden. Leo was a self-help guru who preached love so much that he became known as Dr. Love. And he once wrote, A single rose can be my garden, a single friend my world. And he also wrote, There are many miracles in the world to be celebrated, and for me, garlic is the most deserving. 
It's time to grow that garden library with today's book, Passions by Carolyn Rome. This book came out in 2021 at the end of the year in December. And this is actually a collection of three books. And these books feature Carolyn's passions. And so you have a book called Flowers and Gardens, and then a book called Feminine Touch, which is all about how Carolyn loves to decorate. And then finally, a book called Furry Friends, which of course shares Carolyn's love of animals, especially her pups which is so fun to see. And I have to say that I love the book sleeve that these books slip into because the artwork on the book sleeve is reminiscent of Maria Sibylla Mirian. I just absolutely love this cover. But Carolyn, when she was talking about this set of books, she writes, I hope that this little trio of books about the joy that I found in flowers and gardening allure in feminine style, and the love of furry friends delights and inspires you as it has me. Now, when I think about this book set, I think about it like a gift, a little book set gift. So if you're looking for something special for yourself or for a friend, this little set of books should be at the top of your list. Now, the photography in all of these little booklets is absolutely stunning. It's all Carolyn Rome. If you're a Carolyn Rome fan, if you love her home in Connecticut, if you've watched any of her styling videos on YouTube, then you will immediately recognize the deep, saturated hues and the incredible compositions that she puts together with flowers and exquisite objects in her home. And the balance of color and form and architecture, all the incredible details that she pulls together are just drop-dead gorgeous. This book is 240 pages of Carolyn Rome's Passions, Her Favorite Things, Flowers and Gardens, Feminine Allure in Design, and Furry Friends. You can get a copy of Passions by Carolyn Rome and support the show using the Amazon link in today's show notes for around $34. All right, we wrap up today's show with a botanic spark from this day in 1962. It was on this day, March 31st, back in 1962, that a landscape worker hit a line that connected President Kennedy's White House to the Strategic Arms Command. It was the line that was vital to launching a nuclear attack. Well, this all came about because of a project that was led by Bunny Mellon, who was in charge of the design for a new rose garden outside of the president's office. Robert Kennedy once famously reflected on Bunny in the garden, and he said these words, During cabinet meetings, we would see her out there in the rose garden, a little figure with a bandana on her head. It's just so delightful to think about Bunny out there working like that. But one of Bunny's first tasks at the White House was to find a gardener who could implement her designs. And she handpicked a man named Irvin Williams, who was a government gardener at the Kenilworth Aquatic Gardens. And after Bunny recruited him and then brought him to the White House, he ended up staying on as the head gardener there for almost 50 years. And I remember talking about his retirement here in the last four or five years or so. So he stayed there a long time, five decades, and cast such a tremendous shadow on the gardens and the landscaping around the White House. But in those early talks of the Rose Garden redesign that Bunny was marshalling, the Park Department had voiced concerns that 
some of the underground lines might be hit. So people were aware that this was a risk. But it was on this day, back in 1962, that the underground lines were cut during ground preparation work. And Bunny recalled that the problem was handled calmly and that she was never reprimanded. Bunny found the perfect magnolia trees for the White House over by the Tidal Basin. They were overlooking the Jefferson Memorial. And when she said she wanted those trees, once again, the Parks Department said no because of the cost involved. But here's where Irvin Williams came to the rescue. The gardener that Bunny had recruited, Irvin Williams, pat her back, and he made arrangements to have the trees brought to the White House. Now, the roses that were in the Rose Garden included a yellow rose from the state of Texas, and it was called the Speaker Sam Rose in honor of the late Speaker of the House, Sam Rayburn. And then there was also a bright red variety from the World's Fair, and then a white rose named Frau Karl Druschke and pink Dr. Roses. So you had the yellow, the red, the white and the pink, very colorful. Well, 24 days later, after the underground line was hit, so sometime in April, the garden was finally complete. It had magnolia trees and roses, and it was unveiled to the public, and people loved it. The updated rose garden was an instant success, and the artist and friend of the Kennedys, a man named William Walton, later wrote about it. He said, President Kennedy's pleasure in that garden was infinite. High praise. Well, that's it for today's show. Just remember that you have a standing invitation to join the free Facebook group for listeners of the show. The next time you're over at Facebook, just search for Daily Gardener Community, where you'd search for a friend and then request to join. And if you'd like more of The Daily Gardener, you can subscribe to the newsletter over at thedailygardener.org. And don't forget that you can also show your support for the show by using the Buy Me a Coffee link over at the website or in today's show notes. This is Jennifer Ebling. Thanks for listening to The Daily Gardener. And remember, for a happy, healthy life, garden every day. Thank you.